You are with 3ABN Cyber School panel. My name is John Dinsey, and we have a panel of the 3ABN family that is here with us. We are on lesson number 12 that is entitled Biblical Worldview. The title for this quarterly is Life Everlasting on Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. And now I'd like to introduce our panel, and it is Pastor James Rafferty to my left. Good to be here, Pastor John. I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled The Body as a Temple. The body is a temple. Praise the Lord. Sister Jill Morricone, what do you have? I have Tuesday's lesson, The Mind of Christ. The Mind of Christ. Oh, nice. Praise the Lord. And we have Sister Shelley Quinn, smiling as always. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday's lesson is The Guidance of the Spirit. Amen. And Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. I have Thursday's lesson entitled, Ready for His Appearing. Mm. Amen. Mm. Could you please lead us into uh, prayer, please? Absolutely. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you on this day, God. Mm -hmm. We thank you for your never-ending love, the grace mm -hmm. and mercy that you pour out upon us each and every day. Mm -hmm. And as we take on yet another series of lessons, Lord, uh, I pray that here on the Sabbath School panel, you'll pour out your spirit, that each and every one of us will speak according to your word, mm -hmm. and that more than anything, all those watching, including us, everyone around the world, that we are drawn closer to Jesus because of what we're studying here today. So draw us to you, Lord, and we turn this time over to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, uh, the lesson is entitled, The Biblical Worldview, and by the way, if you do not have a lesson, you can download one for free at 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. I am now covering the Sabbath portion, which is uh, bringing out the memory text from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Mm -hmm. And may you, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, that is a New King James Version. And the lesson says that the book of Revelation speaks of two major globalizations prior to the second coming of Christ. The one is the Revelation 13, which describes the globalization of error. Mm. But uh, there is the second one, which is described in Revelation chapter 14, when the everlasting gospel will be preached to all, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. Uh, during this time, of course, Satan is busy and every wind of doctrine is blowing, as mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Why? Because Satan wants to deceive as many people as possible. And this is why I am uh, praising the Lord for 3 a.m., because we're preaching the Andalusia Three Angels messages and pointing people to God's mm. book, the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the great controversy, page 588, has this quote uh, mentioned in the lesson. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and mm -hmm. Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. Mm. Great Controversy, page 588. Sunday's portion, the model of Jesus. The model of Jesus. And the first scripture that we're going to go to is Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Hmm. Take a look at this and consider. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And so this is a, a little description of that he loved God and loved his fellow man. And he was in favor with both. But notice it says he increased in wisdom and stature. We, by God's grace, should increase in wisdom and stature. Some of us have re reached a stature as far as height may be concerned. But we can continue to go towards the goal of being to the stature of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in spirituality. And the Desire of Ages, page 68, this is also in the lesson. Notice how it, it describes Jesus. His mind was active and penetrating with a thoughtfulness and wisdom beyond his years. His character was beautiful in its symmetry. The powers of mind and body developed gradually in keeping with the laws of childhood. As a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness of disposition. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb. Mm -hmm. 
and a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. Mm. It, in principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. Mm. The Desire of Ages, page 68 and 69. So when we consider Jesus as our model, we need to look at his life, we need to read his words, take a look at his actions. The Bible describes him as rising up a great while before day. He went to a place apart to pray. Mm -hmm. He looked for opportunities to spend in prayer and in meditation, considering God's word. And we can very easily tell that when uh, he was meeting with people, and even facing Satan, in t well, facing temptation, he said, it is written. Mm -hmm. And he would ask people, how do the scriptures read to you? Mm. And so you can see that the scriptures were a part of his daily life. Let's consider Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, mm. but also mm. for the interest of others. And this is what Jesus did. He looked for the interests of others. And Paul is exhorting us to look at the interests of others. Don't just think about self, self, self. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, like some people say, uh, here, uh, I am first, me is second, and myself is third. <laughs> this is not the way we should be. Uh, uh, verse 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. Wow, yeah. this is mind uh, blowing, as they say. <laughs> and he, it, uh, God, uh, being worshiped uh, by the angels, mm -hmm. subject of all praise, honor, and glory, he became a bondservant mm. and coming in the likeness of men. And it says, in being found in appearance as a man, or in fashion as a man, as the King James Version says, mm -hmm. he humbled himself mm -hmm. and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He was willing to die instead of sinning. Yes. Praise be to his holy name. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So let this mind be in you. He humbled himself. We should humble ourselves before the Lord. Mm -hmm. I like this quote from uh, Science of the Times, September 3, uh, 1902. And this is why I'm sharing it with you. Those who desire to be transformed in mind and character are not to look to men. And this is unfortunately what most of us do. Mm. We look at people yeah. and we say, I want to be like that person. I remember our, when our son Samuel was small, he was beginning to look around and he uh, met our neighbor, Mr. Herb, and he said, I want to be a cowboy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, later he said, I want to be a fireman. And so as you go, through life, you began to look at people and you began to admire what they do, how maybe they walk, how they talk. And you began to think, oh, I want to be a teacher. I don't know how many of us here say, I think I want to be a teacher or I want to be a doctor. And so we look at these things. But when we talk about uh, our spirituality, our character, our example is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He is our divine example. God gives the invitation, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. By conversion and transformation, Men are to receive the mind of Christ. By what? Conversion and transformation. Well, how are we to be transformed? <laughs> well, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, But we all with open face are looking into a glass, the glory of the Lord, are transformed into His likeness, uh, glory even glory. from glory to glory. So let this mind be in you also, which was in Christ Jesus. Uh, and so uh, everyone is to stand before God with an individual faith, an individual experience, knowing for himself that Christ is formed within the hope of glory. For us to imitate the example of any man, even one whom we might regard as nearly perfect in character, would be to put our trust in a defective human being, one who is unable to impart a jot or a tittle of perfection. Mm. Our example is Jesus. 
And the wonderful thing is that not only is Jesus our example, but he's willing to live in us to do a work that, is, that no one else could do, to transform us into his likeness. So I invite you to let Jesus in every single day. Yes. Because as you do this, he continues this work of transformation. And this is why I need to read Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Jesus says, right now to you, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You want rest? Mm. You can rest from trying to uh, be like Jesus on your own. <laughs> you can rest Good. from the worry and uh, stress that some people say, I got I to gotta do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. And let Christ in you, mm -hmm. who will work in you to accomplish his will. It says in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle mm -hmm. and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So daily, uh, the invitation is learn from me. Jesus says, learn from me. And so he has so much to teach us. And uh, I encourage you to do this. And it says, he is meek and lowly. It says gentle and lowly in the New King James Version. Meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We need that rest that Jesus offers. And he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Contrary to popular belief, mm -hmm. the yoke of Jesus is easy mm -hmm. and his burden is light. And so I encourage you to consider Jesus. What an example we have in him. Oh, I think I have time to read this one. This is uh, from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 34 to 38. Notice what it says. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, And truly, I perceive that God knows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He is Lord of all. It is peace through Jesus Christ that you can receive. Uh, I continue in verse 37. The word that you know, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of uh, which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was in him. So what did Jesus go around doing? He went around doing good, yeah. being kind to others, showing mercy to others and pointing others the way of life. And so he is our example. He is the one we should imitate. He is the one that we need to spend the most time with mm -hmm. because only by spending time with him will we be transformed to be like him. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor John. My name is James Rafferty and I have Monday's lesson, The Body as a Temple. And we're going to be looking at the worldview, the biblical worldview, and comparing that with this idea of dualism. The quarterly goes on to say here that the dualistic theory of a mortal body with an immortal soul has generated various theories about the human body. For example, for the ancient Greek philosophers, the human body was the prison of the soul, which was liberated by death. So in an echo of this pagan concept, many Christians today believe that the body is the temporal housing of the immortal soul, which will be regenerated or excuse me, reintegrated with the body at the resurrection. So by contrast, pantheists make the human body divine. Mm -hmm. They believe that God and the universe are one and the same. For them, all things are God and the human body is part of the one single integrated and universal divine substance. Surrounded by these conflicting theories, the author goes on to say, on the subject, we must stand firm on what the Bible teaches regarding the nature of humanity. So let's look at the biblical worldview of the human body. We're going to look at a couple of texts. The first ones are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you'd like to open your Bibles there to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 19 and 20. And then we're going to also reference 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. And the question is asked, how can we understand our bodies are the temple of God and the temple of the Holy Spirit in a positive way to influence our lifestyle? Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Paul says with a question mark like he's uh, astonished. What? <laughs> know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Mm -hmm. For you are bought with a price, verse 20. Therefore... Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
1 Corinthians 10, 31 goes on to say, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Why? Because our bodies were created by God and our bodies were redeemed by God. Amen. We are the purchased possession of the blood of Jesus Christ. The everlasting covenant has been put down through Christ and God for us so that we have been purchased. We've been redeemed. Our bodies, as well as everything we are, belong to God. Our destiny, our future, our hope, everything is in Jesus Christ. Amen. The author goes on to say, both Adam and Eve were created in God's own image, in God's own likeness for or Genesis 1, 26 and 27, which was reflected not only in their character, but also in their physical aspect. Because that image was marred and even hidden by the presence of sin, the work of redemption is to restore human beings to their original condition, including their physical health to the degree possible that we can one day again partake of the tree of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this restoration process, he goes on to say, is a lifetime process. Um, and it will be completed at the second coming of Jesus Christ. You see, because we've got uh, a gospel that causes us to be redeemed from sin's past, redeemed from sin's present, its power, mm -hmm. and redeems, redeemed from sin's effect. That is how it's affected us. It's taken away the immortality that God gave to us in the Garden of Eden when we could partake of the tree of life. That's been removed from us and God wants to restore it to us. God never intended that we would die. God never intended that our lives would end. And so that immortality is going to be restored, we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, 53 and 54. Once again, we are going to have access to the tree of life. This mortal will put on immortality. Mm -hmm. Once again, the God-ordained perpetuity of immortality will be ours, just like it is with all of his creation. In fact, it tells us in Revelation 22, verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So God alone is God. God alone has immortality. Creation is granted immortality, whether men or angels, but we are not God in any shape or form. Pantheism is not supported in the Bible. It's not a biblical worldview. We are created beings, created in the image of God and ordained to be restored to God. And because of that, our souls are not some separate entity that has immortality independent of God. Our bodies are the, the, the temple, the place where the spirit of God is to dwell and together they make up a living soul. And that's why we need to take care of our bodies. You know, this, this idea that our bodies aren't significant, they're just some kind of temporary housing, it doesn't really matter, it's really the spirit, it's really the soul that matters, causes people not to treat their bodies as the temple of God. And that's why Paul is saying, what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of God? In fact, in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, the apostle wrote to his friend Gaius and he said, Beloved, beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health just as well as your soul is in good health. So that completely derails this dualistic idea that, well, the body is just something we're going to throw away and, you know, it's the soul that's important. No, the soul and the body are combined together as one. You know, the, the body and the spirit make us a living soul, a living created being. So if we recognize that a human being is indivisible, it's an indivisible entity, the author goes on to say, and that religion embraces all aspects of human life, then we should consider that our physical health also is a religious duty. We should be guided by the inspired principles of whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we should do all to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which we referenced earlier. But then again, we need to also remember that we live in a fallen world, mm -hmm. right? So good people, healthy people, people who follow the principles that God has laid out in His Word can still be affected by can still suffer mm -hmm. from this sinful environment. Mm -hmm. We need to trust God, we need to do our best, we need to leave the results with God, but there are times when we're going to suffer the consequences of the environment around us. Let me give you an example. When I was 39 years old, I developed a lump in my throat. 
And I remember thinking to myself, man, that must be, I must have pulled a muscle or something because the day before I'd been working out with a friend and I'd really strained my neck hard and that's when this, this little lump appeared. And so for a couple of years, I was asking people, what do you, how do you deal with a pulled muscle? And they said, well, you massage it, you know, you push it, you try to get that thing to break out, you know. I said, so that was what I would, I would do. I'd be laying in bed at night and I'd just be massaging this tumorous cancer that I thought was a pulled muscle. I'd just be pushing on it, pushing on it, pushing on it. Mm -hmm. Two years later, some friends said, that's not a pulled muscle. You need to get that checked. You need to get an MRI. You need to find out what that is. And sure enough, uh, these friends, uh, friends of ours, Andy and Bob Hunsaker, good friends of us, they um, got me in, got me uh, checked. And sure enough, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Now, the thing that was devastating was that for the last, let's say, 21, 31, 41, for the last uh, 25 or 6 years, I had been a staunch vegetarian. I'd been into exercise, working out. I was in good shape. You know, I was healthy. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. My mom said, you know, look, at, look at you. You've got cancer. I mean, what is this? You know, I, I smoke and I drink and I eat whatever I want and I'm, I'm healthy. And he, look at you. You're doing all these health principles and you've got cancer. And it was difficult at times. It was a challenge, in fact, to, to come to grips with this idea that, you know, that I had cancer, but at the same time, we need to realize that that doesn't mean that we should uh, neglect to take care of this body. In fact, the physician, the attending physician told me, he said, you know what? He said, I give uh, people uh, about an 80% chance if they'll go through with the whole operation of getting the, the cancerous tumor removed. I give about an 80% chance. He said, I'm going to give you a 95% chance. He said, your lifestyle, the way you live, the way you exercise, the way you take care of your body. And of course, that was 20 years ago. Yeah. So praise God. Praise, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. God wants us to take care of this body, but it doesn't mean that we're just going to get a pass on the disease mm. and on the effects of sin that are taking place in our world today. God wants us to recognize this body is a, is a vital part of the whole and that someday we're going to partake of that tree of life. Someday we're going to have immortality, just mm -hmm. like we were partaking of that tree of life in the Garden of Eden. God wants to restore that to us, and our body's going to be part of it. Now, my body and your bodies are going to look a little different than they look right now when we are restored to full glory. But we're still going to know who we are. We're still going to recognize Amen. that character, that personality, that spirit is still going to be there. But our bodies are going to grow up, the Bible says, like calves in a stall. Mm -hmm. We're going to be fully restored health-wise, and we're not going to, the Bible explains, we're not going to need to sleep. We're not going to get tired. Mm -hmm. We're going to run and not be weary. Uh, we're going to walk and not faint. It's going to be a glorious experience, but God wants us to taste a little bit of that right now. And therefore, he says, hey, listen, your body's the temple of God. This is the biblical worldview, and it connects with your spirit to make you a living soul, and someday that's, that's gonna, you're going to experience full restoration in that body. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Well, this, uh, we're just getting started and the blessings are going to continue and we'll be back in just a moment. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 .com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. This is truly an excellent study that we're having and we continue with Sister Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny and Pastor James. Excellent lesson and I loved the personal testimony, God's healing and grace in your life. I'm Jill Morricone. On Tuesday, we look at the mind of Christ and I just want you to know I'm reminded all the time that I need more of the mm -hmm. mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. We're gonna study that. As we look at, and Shelly, I just wanna say, Shelly always gives us our, our lesson and topic. Thank you for giving me this topic. I love this topic. Mm. As we look at the issue of sin, the issue is not a behavior problem. It's a heart problem. Yes. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures. Mark 7. Mark 7, verses 21 to 23. For from within, not externally, mm -hmm. from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, mm -hmm. adulteries, fornication, murder, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all of those we look at as sin, they proceed from the heart. All of these evil things come from within 
and defile a man. Proverbs 4, 23 says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. You know, it's the Sermon on the Mount all over again. Jesus in Matthew chapter mm -hmm. five, we see those six antithetical statements. He tells the Pharisees who thought they had it all together from an external perspective. He says, you have heard it said, you shall not murder, but I say unto you, if you have hatred in your heart, you see, he says that sin originates in the heart. Mm -hmm. It's not a behavior problem. That behavior is an issue, but the behavior comes from the heart. Mm -hmm. We need a heart change. Psalm 24, verses three and four, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, mm -hmm. who has not lifted up his soul to an idol or sworn deceitfully. The basic requirement for the citizens of heaven is a pure heart. Mm. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. We need the mind of Christ. First mm -hmm. Corinthians 2 verse 16 says, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. But we, we have the mind of Christ. So you might be saying, how in the world am I to get the mind of Christ? I love practical Christianity. I think it's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to talk about because we need that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can know doctrines and that's important. But if you don't know Jesus and you don't know how to walk with him, what is it value in your life? Mm -hmm. So let's look at that. We're looking at how to receive the mind of Christ, six keys for receiving the mind of Christ. We're starting in Colossians. Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter three, verse one and two. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind where? On the problems you have? Mm -hmm. No. Set your mind on the problems other people have? No. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Key number one to receiving the mind of Christ is to focus on Christ. Amen. Focus on things above. They say that attention breathes life into anything it touches. Hmm. Wherever you focus your attention, life is breathed into that. You can focus on the solution or the problem. You can focus on the investment or the cost. You can focus on the things of this earth or you can focus your attention heavenward on Christ. Mm -hmm. Receiving the mind of Christ. Step number one is as simple as focusing on him. Mm -hmm. And it's not a momentary focus, okay, I'm good. I had my prayer, I'm good. Or I, I'm gonna go throughout my day and I'm gonna focus my attention elsewhere. No, it's a constant beholding of Christ mm -hmm. as Pastor Johnny referenced with 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. Mm -hmm. Let's look at step number two. We're going to Romans. Romans chapter 12, step number two for receiving the mind of Christ or key number two. Romans 12 verse two. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That word for transformed in the Greek is metamorphosed. It's the experience that we see with the caterpillar who's ugly, who crawls on his belly, who can't do a whole lot, who is transformed or metamorphosed into the butterfly. How are we transformed? How are we metamorphosed? How do we turn from this to having the mind of Christ? It's the renewing of your mind. It is the renovating of your mind. Key number two, allow God to change your mind. You know, we can't change it ourselves, mm -hmm. but we focus on Christ and then we allow him to change our mind. Mm -hmm. Recognize that metamorphosis doesn't happen overnight. The caterpillar doesn't turn into the butterfly overnight. It is a process, but realize that he's the, wor he's the one who does the work in and through us. Mm -hmm. The next scripture is Philippians. We're going to Philippians chapter four, verse eight. I remember memorizing this when I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest or noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. Key number three, fill your mind with godly things. Mm -hmm. 
guard the avenue of the mind. We need to feed on purity, mm -hmm. on truth, mm -hmm. on virtue, mm -hmm. on justice, because we become what we behold. So as we spend time meditating on those things, we receive the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. Next, we're going back to Romans. Romans chapter 13, and key number four really correlates with key number three. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. We talked in Philippians about focusing on godly mm -hmm. things, focusing on things of virtue. That's key number three, fill your mind with godly things. But it's associated with this verse as well, to make no provision for the flesh. Mm -hmm. Key number four, remove temptations from your home and from your heart. Mm. Sin needs to be dealt with quickly at any cost. So I think we need to be on the offense when it comes to sin. In a practical standpoint, if you struggle with pornography, you cut off your internet mm -hmm. or you cancel that magazine subscription or you get rid of the TV. You might say this is a harsh thing, but whatever the besetting issue is, Take that away. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't have that in your home and in your heart because in a weak moment, it's easy to step back into that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Key four is just remove the temptation as much as possible from your home and from your heart. Amen. Let's go to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, this is the next key, number five. Hebrews 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind. Mm -hmm. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Mm. Key number five, feed on and assimilate the word of God. Amen. Let God write his law his truth, mm. his character right. in your heart and in your mind. Mm. The Word of God, it reveals our character. The Word of God builds our faith. The Word of God washes us. I love that in Ephesians. He washes us with the washing of the water of the Word. So feed on the Word of God. Our last key is with the scripture, it's in Philippians, that Pastor Johnny read. Philippians chapter two, we're gonna read one verse from that. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And if you read, as Pastor Johnny already read, the mind of Christ was to humble himself. He came from mm -hmm. heaven to mm -hmm. humanity or becoming a man. Then he went to a servant. Mm -hmm. Then he went to death. And not just death, but death on the cross. Mm -hmm. Key number six. Receive the humility of Christ. Amen. I think humility Amen. is part of the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. So how do we receive the mind of Christ? Mm -hmm. Focus on Christ. Focus on things above. Number two, allow God to change your mind. Number three, fill your mind with godly things and associated with that, Remove those temptations mm -hmm. from your home and from <laughs> your heart that you know. We all know in the recesses of our heart what's pulling us from Jesus. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that need to go. Number five, feed on and assimilate the word of God because God's word will change you. And finally, receive the humility of Christ. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was so good, Jill. Thank you so much. And thank you to both of you as well. I'm Shelley Quinn. I have... Wednesday's lesson, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to pick up on what you said. Oh, the mind of Christ, we need it, we want it. Yeah. And yes, it's so important to, to know the word, this is the mind of Christ. But I have to tell you, don't get discouraged. God's plan is salvation by grace through faith. The everlasting covenant is righteousness by faith. And it is not just to deliver us from the penalty of sin. It's not just to justify us by righteousness, but God wants to deliver us and will deliver us from the power of sin. The Bible tells us that, by the way, is sanctification by faith. Did you know that sanctification 
is a synonym of holiness. When we say God is holy, it just means He's totally separated from sin. Mm -hmm. But He wants to work in our hearts to will and to do His good purpose because Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, only those who do the will of God will be in heaven. He says, if you don't keep the law of God, like you were saying in Hebrews 8, 8 through 10, he's going to say to you, depart from me, you who practice mm. lawlessness. See, when Adam and Eve were created, God created them perfectly in his righteousness. He's a God of love. He's a God of light, his righteous character. And he made them in their, his image, but they sinned and they marred his image and that got passed on to us. Mm -hmm. So what God is doing with the everlasting covenant is he is going to restore door righteousness in his people when we trust in him. He just simply asks us, he makes all of the promises. And we know that Jesus Christ is the surety of the covenant. Amen. And he says, he says, in Christ, 2 Corinthians 1 20, all of my promises yeah. are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. <laughs> so Jesus is the surety from God to us. But guess what? He's a surety from us to God because Philippians 2 13 says, he works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. How? Let's look at John chapter 14. Oh, I love, if you want to study on the Holy Spirit, John 14, John chapter 16, and Romans 8, Paul mentions 19 times the Holy Spirit in Romans 8. Mm. But look what Jesus says. And these are the words of Jesus. John 14, 15. If you love me, what? Keep, Keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. See, God is asking us. He makes all of the promises, but he asks us to enter into covenant. He wants our reciprocal love. He wants us to walk in loyalty to him, to walk in obedience to his commandments, motivated by love. But how do we do that? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And this is what happens when you keep the commandments. I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. In the Greek, another helper is allos parakletos. There's two words for another in Greek, allos and heteros. Heteros means another similar, it's in the same, like if I said to you, you've eaten an orange and I've got a banana and I say, you want another piece of fruit? That's heteros. Mm -hmm. But allos means exactly, That's right. identically mm -hmm. like the one it's talking about. So allos parakletos. Jesus was the parakletos. Jesus was the one who was our advocate on earth. He was our counselor. He was our comforter. And now he's saying, if you walk in obedience to me, I'm going to give you another comforter. Allos parakletos. One who is exactly like me. And let me tell you, how do we, how do we explain to somebody that the major tenet of Christianity is one God. Hmm. We have one God, but he's expressed in three persons, God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Mathematically, how do you do that? I was trying to explain it to a Muslim one day who had called here, and I came up with all kinds of ideas everything I'd ever heard about the Holy Spirit. I'm trying, and, and they're on the other line like, huh? I was babbling. God finally showed me one day as I was studying the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies is a cube. The New Jerusalem is a cube. That means its dimensions, the height, width, the length are all the same. And I thought, aha, huh, how do you get a cube? You multiply the same number, the same instance of a number time itself, times itself three times. And I thought, is it that simple? Is God one times one times one equals one, one, mm -hmm. one cubed? 
one to the third power. That's who God is. And he's saying, if you will walk in obedience, Acts 5.32 says, God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey. Yeah. Jesus said in Luke 11, 9, he said, I say to you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. These are linear verbs in the, in the Greek. It means they continue. It's continuous right. action. So the Amplified is the only one that's really got the correct uh, translation of this. It's ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. And what are we asking for? He tells us in verse 13. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and keep on asking? If we are going to enter into covenant, we've got to know God. We've got to submit to his authority. But day by day, we must yield to the Holy Spirit. That is the only way God can sanctify us and separate us from sin. Romans 8, 13, Paul says, uh, if you live according to the flesh, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. You will die. Yeah. He's talking about That's the right. second death here. Mm -hmm. We can't, he says the carnal mind is enmity against the Lord. Mm -hmm. It isn't subject to his law, nor can it be. We need that mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. We need to submit and say, oh Lord, I don't want to live by the flesh and die. But listen to what he says. If by the spirit yes. you put to death the deeds of the body, mm -hmm. you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Do you notice there's a cooperative effort there? He says, if by the Spirit you put to death, the Holy Spirit never forces you to That's act. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can't do it on your own. Right. It's you and the Holy Spirit working together. And then he says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And as we yield to him, we, we get to that point moment by moment. We've got to make decisions. Do I go this way or that way? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit works in us when we submit and say, okay, I, I yield to you. You lead. What's a, what does a yield sign do? It protects us from crashing and burning, doesn't it? So it's kind of like we're saying, okay, you got the right of way. You're the Lord. Lead me. And then we follow in Christ's footsteps. The Bible says righteousness goes before him and makes his Foot, his footprints, the pathway to follow. God wants to make us righteous. That's the whole thing. He's preparing us for eternity with him. He knows how sin causes so many problems, mm -hmm. but he wants to empower you, not only to live righteously, mm -hmm. but he empowers us by the Holy Spirit to take the gospel mm -hmm. to all the world. We cannot live the Christian life without the guidance of the Spirit. That's so right. every morning when you get up, say, oh, Lord, I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking. Fill me afresh with mm -hmm. your Holy Spirit today. Guide me by your good Spirit. Mm -hmm. Lead me in the way everlasting. Mm. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Shelley. Appreciate that. I'm Brian Day, and Thursday's lesson is entitled, Ready for His Appearing. Mm. And how do we get ready for His appearing? Well, you could just sum up everything you've heard so far. Mm. Uh, you know, having the mind of Christ. We need the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. All of these things are vitally important for us to understand how to prepare mm -hmm. and be ready for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, but when I read this, Ready for His Appearing, I couldn't help it. My mind went back to my childhood when I was going to school. Uh, our school every year, or at least every other year, would bring the power team. Uh, mm -hmm. You've heard of this you know, famous group. It's a Christian group called the power team and they'd bring the power team to our, to our school. And, you know, these guys would, you know, tear phone books in half and bend, you know, you know, metal pieces and, you know, bus blocks and all these different things. But I remember the voice just rang in my head as I was reading this, are you ready? And then the, the children would, yeah, 
is I can't hear you. Are you ready? And we, woo, we'd say, we would scream, you know, because we want to see these guys, you know, bend metal and bust blocks and, you know, tear things open. <laughs> but but, but I, I couldn't help but think of that when I read this, ready for his appearing. And, I, and I, I'm asking myself that question. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you today, mm -hmm. are you ready? Mm -hmm. Are you ready? Do you know what it means to be ready for the soon appearing of Jesus Christ? Well, the lesson has us diving right into 2 Peter chapter 3, mm -hmm. verse 14, a, a, a short but simple verse here that I think really sets the tone for what it is we're going to be studying together here in the next few minutes. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, it says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. We're looking forward, hopefully, to the soon return of Jesus Christ. We're looking forward to the time in which sin and all of this old life and the carnality of the world has all passed away. Hopefully, we're looking forward to those things. But notice it says, be diligent to be found by Him in peace. Mm. And then these last few words here, which some people struggle with a little bit, without spot and blameless. Mm. Now, some people might take those words and say, well, that means to be perfect because well, the sacrifice had to be perfect. It had mm -hmm. to be without spot. It had to be blameless. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the only absolute perfect uh, uh, sacrifice was Jesus Christ. Jesus right. was the most absolute uh, spotless one and blameless one out of all of the people that we could ever know or read about or, or talk about. But nonetheless, my friends, God is calling us. He's saying, if mm -hmm. you want to be ready for my appearing, I need you also to be, from my perspective, my understanding, without spot and blameless. Let's go to 1 John 3, chapter uh, chapter 3, uh, excuse me, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. These verses uh, are ones that we've read often, but it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, verse 2, it says, Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But notice these next few verses, or the next part of the verse here, it says, But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And then verse 3, And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as he is pure. And again, even within Christianity today, even within the Seventh-day Adventist church, there's a little bit of a divide in some people's hearts and minds as to what does this mean? What does it mean to be pure and just, just like he is? Uh, First John chapter two, verse six says, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So the Bible, I mean, there's tons of examples in the Bible where Jesus is saying, be like me, be like me, be like me. Have the mind of Christ. We ought to walk as He walks. We ought to do as He do. We, we should, he is our example. But yet there's a camp of people that says, oh, but we can't live up to that. We, can, we certainly can't do that. I can't be like Jesus because I'm a sinner. And yes, we are a sinner. We have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. But I'm going to read some quotes from you uh, from the Spirit of Prophecy as well as the Bible that we need, to, we need to have in our minds and hearts. Because Jesus, because of what He has done, and what he has accomplished has paved the way and provided the same power source for us that he had so that he could walk justly before the Father. Desire of Ages, page, page 24. And I'm asking the question here, what is possible for us? Mm. Because we know that we are not absolutely perfect in the sense that God is the most absolute perfect being in existence. But God does call us to a perfection, a character mm -hmm. perfection. And we're going to look at what that means now. Uh, what is possible for us? Desire of Ages, page 24. Notice what this says. He exercised, speaking of Christ, he exercised in his own behalf <laughs> no power that is not freely offered to us. So the same possibility, the same things that Christ was able to do, the same path that Christ walked in order for him to be able to, to accomplish what the Father wanted him to accomplish. We have that same power source available to us. Selected Messages, book one, page 409 says, Christ laid hold on the throne of God and there is not a man or woman who may not have access to the same help through faith in God. May, man may become a partaker of the divine nature. So we have that same power source available to us. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we've already read this, but we're looking at the concept of what does it mean to be perfect? Because there's lots of, there's lots of text in the Bible. And I want to just you know, clear the air on this. When we're talking about perfection, many people have a different idea in their mind. Some people 
people think perfection means to be absolute sinless in the, in the, in the staunch, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, absolute sense. Uh, and I believe that we can be that only through Christ Jesus, but it's a process. Remember 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Mm -hmm. Sanctification is a process, and we know that God is taking us through that process. But notice what Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, we talked about the mind of Christ, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, and here it is, perfect will of God. Can we mm. fall into that perfect will of God? Can that perfect will of God be a reality mm -hmm. in our life? If it wasn't so, it wouldn't be written here. God has provided that for us. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, it says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there may be, may be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I'm just going to read through these really quick. Rapid fire. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, it says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Notice, mm -hmm perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to be measure, or to, to the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for us to come to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ? Mm -hmm. Some would say, no, Christ was absolutely perfect in every sense. I can't possibly measure up to that. You in and of yourself can't, but with the power of God working through you, you certainly can, according to Scripture. Colossians chapter 1 verse 28 says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect perfect in Christ. That's Colossians 1.28. So let's nail this down. What are we talking about when we're talking about perfection here? This comes from Christ Object Lessons, page 69. It says, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then we will come to claim them, as, then he will come to claim them as his own. Are you ready for his appearing? Because getting ready for his appearing means to become like Christ. It means to allow Jesus Christ to will and to do his work in your life so that his character, his righteous character is perfectly reproduced in you. Education, page 105 and 106. I love this example that she gives here because you say, well, Ryan, I, you know, I, I don't feel perfect. I, I, I know I need to be perfect. And then there's others, you know, there's always two extremes. There's the ones yes. that say, well, you know what? I can kind of just live and, you know, you know, this kind of this dualistic perspective mm -hmm. we talked about. You know what? You know, what I do in the flesh and what I do in my body really doesn't matter because God knows my heart and I'm just going to live however which way I want to and God still loves me. That's a very liberal, very extreme way to, to live. Mm -hmm. Then you have the opposite end of the spectrum those who are just staunch legalists and they, you know, perfection, 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 perfection in, in the absolute sense. You can't sin. You can't sin. That's a sin. That's a sin. That's a sin. It's just a really, really dreadful way to live your life. But if you find the beautiful balance that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I love this right here. Education page 105 and 106. The germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And the development of the plant is a figure of the development of character. There can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. Mm. And its growth, as its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous, so is the growth of character. Don't miss this next point. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yet if God's purpose for us is filled, there will be constant advancement. Yeah. So you know what? You may not be where, you, where you're looking forward and want to be. You may not be there, but praise God, you're not where you once were. But where you are in God's eyes may be as you are surrendered to Him and His will, you may be perfect in God's eyes. And that's the thing. Perfection is not in the absolute sense, from in the, in the sense of God's perfection, but character perfection as you are surrendered daily to Him. My friends, the most important thing, according to Psalm chapter 95 and verse 7 and 8, and I'm going to read here verse, uh, the, the end of verse 7 and the beginning of verse 8. It says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I think, they, they think that's what we have to yeah. get into our minds is we need not harden our hearts, but look to Jesus Christ to will and to do his good work in our life. To, to be prepared for his appearing means to be fully surrendered Amen. each and every day and to be perfect along the way as he works out 
his, his, his work in your life to prepare you for his appearing. Amen. 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 What a blessing it has been to listen to every one of you. Uh, but we do have a moment for each one of you to give a final comment. So just this whole idea of dualism and the world, uh, the biblical worldview, Jesus Christ came to save us from the penalty of sin, mm -hmm. from the power of sin, and from the presence of sin. That includes this mortal body being changed into immortality. Amen. When we think about the mind of Christ, um, sometimes it seems difficult, and how am I to acquire that? But one of my favorite scriptures, John 6, 37, Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. The beautiful thing is we come to him, and he gives us that mind. Amen. Three quick scriptures in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. May the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. May he make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight. And you know what? My favorite is 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse uh, 12. Paul says, Oh, may God make you increase and abound in love to all so that, that's a purpose statement, he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord. Romans 5, 5, God pours his love, his essence into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Mm -hmm. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. Call out on Jesus today and he will pour out his spirit, genuine spirit on you. Thank you so much, Pastor James Rafferty, Sister Gio Morricone, Sister Shelley Quinn, and Pastor Ryan Day. And I'd like to read this to you. Jesus is our motto. As our example, we have one who is all in all, the chiefest among 10,000, one whose excellency is beyond comparison. He graciously adapted his life for universal imitation. Mm -hmm. United in Christ were wealth and poverty, majesty, abasement, unlimited power, and meekness and lowliness, which in every soul who receives him will be reflected. Praise the Lord.